Hey team, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at Web API Authentication.NET 6. Hope you enjoy this video. This video, part 3, continues where part 2 ended. I'm using the same project, so if you haven't watched part 2, please check that out before you continue. While this video uses part 2, you can use your own project and easily add in the features of this video to your own project. The goal of this video is to add authentication to our web API. A second goal is to add enough features to Swagger that allows you to use Swagger to not only display, but to execute your web methods in a authenticated environment. Let's take a look at what we can do. In part two, we loaded 10 packages into this project. In part three, we need to load three additional. Let's install these three additional packages. Right click on packages, then look for manage NuGet packages. Our first change is going to be to modify app settings.json. Notice that we have a new section authentication from lines five to nine. It has three keys, secret key, issuer, and audience. Secret key is obvious. Issuer is the location that will be running an audience. Well, we're going to need a definition for that. First, it's normally known by AUD within the JWT. Now, it defines the expected recipient of the generated token. For instance, who will consume this token to protect the API call? Normally, it's the system hosting the API, and that is the intended audience. In this case, todo.api is that audience. Let us make the changes to program.cs. Notice that we have eight using statements now. Let's make sure your app has the same amount. Then we will scroll down to line 28 to 43. This is where we are going to add authentication to this web API. And notice that we'll be using the bearer. Now we're going to add JWT bearer, and that has a few options. Remember when we modified app settings.json, we had the issuer, audience, and that secret key. That's what will give us the token validation parameter. And then on line 55, notice Builder services add swagger. We now have options. The first option is support non nullable reference types. A couple of generations ago, it's used to protect against possible null references. Our next one is the operation filters. We're going to be using a class called authorize operation filter, and you will see what that does in just a moment. Our next Option is on line 69, options, add security definition, bearer, then a new open API security scheme. Let's see where we use those. Notice when I click on authorize, well, you can see right away JWT authorization header. You can see that text is right here. Now, the in, the parameter location, is at the top here. The type will be HTTP. The scheme will be bearer. And the bearer format will be JWT. What this is doing is, you see this input text box here. We are going to be pasting in a token. And we need to be able to tell Swagger what type of token that is. So when we click on the authorize button, it will know how to use it appropriately. Our next section is this open API info, and that is at the top of our program. Notice we say version one, you see that one there, title to do API, and then description, learn how to use ASP.NET Core Web API. You can see that there. And then we have contact and a license. And then I use that object info into options.swagger.v1 info. And there you have builder.services.addswaggergen. And the rest of this file is identical 
to part two. So there you have program.cs all done. Just a moment ago, I told you I would be back to talk about line 65, operation filter. We have a method here called authorize operation filter, and that is going to work with this authorize attribute. If we look at our employee controller, notice on line 25, we have an attribute that's called authorize. On this one right here, this is saying, I'm gonna tell you how to handle the outcome in Swagger. So this is like a, you have to add this just to get Swagger to work if we're going to use authorization. Now, the first part of this, context method info, this is going to use reflection. Using your controllers, it will look for the authorize attribute. And when it finds authorize, it's going to build that list. And then after it executes, it's going to say, return any response type already assigned, and let's add these two other possible responses. That's a unauthorized and a forbidden. Let's run the app and let's see what that actually means. As you can see, I'm inside Swagger. I have not authorized it yet. I'm going to come down to the first method here called API employee. Then notice, I come down here to my possible responses. These are the possible responses a 200, a 401, and a 403. Notice in the controller, I have authorized, and I can only ever return an OK. Inside of authorize operation filter, notice I have the 401, 403. These two additional possible result types will be added to any route that has the authorize attribute. You can see when I clicked on the execute button, I did indeed receive a 401. Remember, a 401 was one of the ones I was going to return. So that is what I received. But as a front end developer, when I see the responses that are available, this one can receive a 200, a 401, and a 403. So I would have to code those up in my front end to handle all of these. Now notice for every one that has the key, we would get that. Now for this next one, notice when I look at that, I come down to my responses and notice this is telling me I can only ever receive a 200. So this is pretty much telling me I can't receive anything other than a 200. It is possible that I get an error and I receive something else. I just don't expose that to the front end developer. On our next method, notice that we're going to get that same 200 and 401, 403. Now you know where these are coming from. They're coming from the file authorize operation filter. Let's examine how to implement these two possible result types in the controller code. Let's first remove these two possible types from the apply function and view the generated Swagger output. I commented off the code, I recompiled, I re-executed, and here we go. I look at that and I'm saying, okay, 400, now what's available? Oh, look at that, 401 and 403 are missing. Now you know how the apply function assists the Swagger documentation. While the apply function touches globally, the produces response type is singularly. Notice we are informing the Swagger viewer this method can possibly produce the following response types. This route could possibly produce a response type of 200, 401, and a 403. Let's actually use Swagger and see what it provides. And here is the method that we're looking at, employee. Notice we come down there, we have our 200, we have our 401 and our 403, but now notice that they give us an example value, you know, if it does give me a 401. And if it returns a 403, it also gives me an example. Now, guess what? When we were inside of the source code, we could have actually written some more code to actually produce this and maybe even give better output for the developer. So now you see the two options that we can use.
In our next example, insert employee async. Notice I say authorize. Well, that means there's going to be some type of return values. Notice I'm going to do a created and a bad request. Now, we know this one right here is a 201. Let's go see what a, see if it, uh, just the authorized by itself can tell me it's going to get a 201. So here we are, insert employee async. I'm going to come down, notice, I come down to my responses, a 200. Only a 200? In fact, this method cannot even return a 200. It can either return a created or a bad. Let's now authenticate, authorize, and do that test on insert employee to see if our hypothesis is correct. I'm first going to go and generate a key. So notice I, let's say JSON. Now this would be my username and password from some kind of login screen. And then I'm going to execute that. That will then generate me a token. I'm then going to copy that token. And because we've set up Swagger correctly, this authorize button is available. Then I know that it's going to be a JWT. So I paste that in there and then I say authorize. Then I hit close. Now notice our keys are now dark. Notice they're kind of closed keys now. Now on insert employee, when I go to look at that, Let's cancel, let's try again. And notice I'm gonna to try to insert a new employee. So let's say new employee. And then I'm gonna come down here. Now this is telling me it can only get a 200. But notice it returned me a 201. It said 200 was one of them that I could return, but I can never get a 200. I got a 201, that is the created. So I think you're understanding this file now and what this is all about. You're understanding the authorize. You're understanding about the filters, when and how to use them. And here is all the source code for authorize operation filter CS. There's a total of 53 lines. You'll have about 10 seconds to type that in. So hit pause and make sure you get all this source code. It's very important. What does it mean to be authenticated? You can imagine we're a website. We have some login form. A user types its username and password and hit login. Our web service is called to validate and authenticate the user credentials. Now, because this is a login form, I know that I do not have a authentication token, a JWT. So I have to call a special controller to actually generate that for me and then send it back to me, you know, the website or Postman or Swagger so I can keep using the API. Now, I have a 20 minute timeout. So that means if I don't use it, I get timed out and that JWT is no longer valid. So let's see what happens. The front end calls authenticate. And then we are going to say, okay, I got JSON. So I got the username and password from the screen. And then I'm gonna execute that. And then after I execute that, notice I got a 200. And this is the JWT. So then I'm gonna copy that. And I'm gonna come up to this authorize and I'm gonna place that in there. And now notice that my key is closed. The user's name and password has been validated and a JWT was created and that token is now returned to the caller. Let's create a file in the controller folder called authentication controller CS. And that is this file right here. And notice that you have six using statements. You have a route API authentication. Then we have a constructor. And then we have our first method, authenticate. Now this is what the postman, this is what a website and even Swagger would call to authenticate. And notice our first method in there is to validate user credentials. So the input parameter is request. A request is an object that gets the username and password then that is going to go into user. Now, if user is null, you're going to get unauthorized and I'm out of here. 
Now, if I did have a valid account in the database or wherever you got that information from, remember the authentication secret key is from the appsettings.json file. Notice it is encoded in a symmetric security key and created. Then the algorithm HMACSHA256 produces the signing credentials. I'm going to lay down three claims, the given name, the surname, and an email. And then I'm going to build the object JWT security token. And then to get that to work, I have to call this handler and they have a method in there called write token, where now I get that user token and I'm going to return that to the user. The user then needs to store this in their, whatever they're using, a website would store it in their cookies. And that cookie needs to be of type HTTP only. You can't put that up in a session variable. This is very, very sensitive. We have to keep this very private. But that is our method, authenticate, from lines 24 down to line 64. On line 27, validate user credential. It's just a method I placed in here to simulate doing what it should be done. For instance, there should be some kind of database with a table where I can get a username and a password to make sure that they are valid. Here I've simulated, I found this first name, last name person, and I'm going to return that to the caller. And when I return it to the caller, it's not null. So I keep marching my way through that and I end up building the user token. The site user, I have the ID, login, first name, last name, email, and then a constructor. And I use that all inside of validate credentials. Now, once we get this token, Swagger, they need to store that so we can keep reusing it. And we can reuse it up to 20 minutes. So notice this is a 20 minute sliding window. So as long as I keep you know, seeing it, then I, this thing stays active. Let's put a breakpoint on line 61 and then let's see what happens. The front end has called me. I don't have a key. So I need to come down and say, I need to make a new key. So I give my username and password. I execute it. Now we're inside of our code. Now I'm going to validate this request and notice it's strain strain. That's my username password F11. I'm going to come in here and guess what? I'm just going to return first name, last name. I kind of like did a simulated lookup in the database. Now, is that null? No, it's not null. So now I'm going to go get that secret key and I'm going to encode it. And now it looks something unreadable. Now we're going to do a HMAC SHA-256. I'm going to do some claims, the first name, last name, and email. And then I'm going to build this token. And that's going to tell me about that timeout, give me the claims and the issuer and audience. And then notice this write token. I'm actually going to build the token string. Inside the user token is our JWT. Now there are several sites that we can go and look at that. Let's take a look at jwt.io. This is jwt.io, a website. I have pasted our generated JWT into the big box. Notice the three colors. Each color represents a segment in the token. The token type is in red. In mauve, you have our claims the boundaries for the start and stop usage, who issued it, and what is the audience. And then notice at the bottom, I pasted in our secret key into the box verify signature section. This token should be protected, saved into a cookie, and have the attribute HTTP only, so it can be secure, to be sent to the web service to execute our web method call. We did it team, web authentication all done. It's in the bag. 
I hope I was able to teach you this feature and have removed any complexity you may have had concerning how to implement this. Now, hopefully with this video, you'll be able to implement this feature in your own projects. If you have any questions or have comments about this video, please leave a comment below. And maybe even give a thumbs up if you think this video was worth that. Thank you for your time. Look forward to seeing you back in my next video. Have a great week.